I just have a short announcement uh, before uh, Volker's final lecture. Um, as part of the process of planning for uh, future versions of this uh, uh, work of this uh, program, we ask all of the participants to complete a short uh, survey on your experiences during the program. Those surveys will be made available starting more or less now uh, on the uh, table outside the lecture theater here and in the common area in Bloomberg Hall. Uh, there will also be boxes there that you can deposit the surveys uh, uh, when you're done. And we ask you, if at all possible, to take the time uh, to fill those out so that uh, we can do a better job next time. Uh, Volker. Yeah, good morning. Welcome to my last lecture. Um, I guess it's getting late in the week and you all will probably be tired by now from equations and discretization schemes. And yet I'm probably going to torture you a bit more with some yet, an, yet another scheme this morning, moving mesh hydrodynamics. But I also would like to entertain you a bit with some nice movies uh, about this new scheme. And I've designed sort of this lecture as a sort of a bit of a summary also of what I said previously. And I want to start out with pointing out a few uh, of the accuracy issues that we face in the context uh, of cosmological structure formation simulations so in this uh, regime that, that Mike just described, basically, where we form galaxies all over the place. That's also where I usually work in. Uh, and that is a particular challenging um, regime. And maybe both methods that, that were discussed during the week, uh, Eulerian grids and also Lagrange and SPH approaches, have problems, actually. In, in this regime, and maybe we should look for a, a third alternative, and that's uh, what I'm going to tell you about, one possibility for doing this. So a couple of uh, accuracy issues, just to, to remind you of those again. This, this is a plot of the so-called Santa Barbara Cluster Comparison Project, and I'm sure many of you have seen this. This is now 10 years old. And at the time, I think there was a workshop in Santa Barbara where, where simulators met, and they set out uh, on an experiment where they shared the same initial conditions uh, set up such that uh, you would win dark matter and hydrodynamics in a Einstein City universe at the time, you would make a big galaxy cluster. And <clears throat> the interest here was to see how well the different hydrodynamical codes uh, would agree upon the final properties of the simulated cluster. And there were 12 codes tested, and here you see the surface brightness images of the X-ray emission. And um, the good news here is that all the codes made a cluster, actually. But you see, there are, you know, at face value, you would think, oh, wow, there are some quite wild variations, because certainly this, this map doesn't quite look as nearly as smooth as the Epis ones, and there's a core missing here, um, and so on. So there are certainly differences in detail. But actually, if you analyze this more closely, you'll find that um, the results even at the time where the, where the field was much less mature than it is now, there was, uh, in the bulk properties, there was a, a reasonable agreement. But the devil is in the detail, and some of the differences that showed up already at that time, it's actually, they are still haunting us, and we're trying to understand the numerical origin for these differences. And it's probably best seen in the entropy profile of the cluster. So this is a plot from this paper. You see here uh, the radial entropy profile in spherical shells averaged. Here's the cluster center going out somewhere to the accretion shock around here. And these symbols are different code results. And they uh, were, at the time, most of the codes were sort of SPH-like codes, but there were also a few mesh codes. For example, Greg Vine's code, sort of probably a, an early incarnation of ENSO, presumably. That gave uh, a higher entropy in the core. And that sort of problem here is a more modern calculation by Mike and, and, and Brian. Oh, it's actually even older than, than this comparison project. But it, it shows a result that's still around. If you, if you run the Santa Barbara cluster with any of your favorite mesh codes, with Flash or with Enzo or, or um, Kraftsoft's RT code, you will get um, a relatively large entropy core here in the center. While in SPH codes, um, the entropy tends to, to keep dropping. There have been some discussions that uh, the, for example, the entropy formulation that I've discussed of SPH gives a somewhat higher entropy. That's true, but still, uh, it looks like these SPH results kind of converge to a more steeply falling entropy profile. And <clears throat> so, of course, these, these, this difference is potentially important because um, even so, it affects primarily the inner regions here where there's not much mass, but it then sets the temperature profile and will determine things like the cooling rate you expect. 
from such an object. So these kind of numerical differences are important and ultimately we would like to know also what answer is right. Can you, uh, if you're a hard-nosed Eulerian person, you would probably say, well, you know, Eulerian methods are superior in many respects, so I believe this core, this must be wrong. But maybe this is not the only uh, true answer. Maybe the real answer is somewhere in the middle and you cannot really be, be, be sure at this point and I would argue that it's probably likely to be somewhere in the middle and that both methods make some small mistake there or a large mistake. And that I already showed. Maybe this issue is related to the effects of mixing. That's the uh, more or less uh, a consensus that's building up that this is, has something to do with it. And I've already shown this that the mixing is very different in the SPH and in the <coughs> Eulerian codes and you know question basically is, is, is that, uh, so is su certainly mixing is certainly suppressed here, but it, it's po potentially a Eulerian code also overmixes at some level because of advection errors, for example, um, and that's, that's something we want to, want to better understand in the future. Now, bef before I, I get to the hydrogen dynamics, back, get back to that, I want to also mention another aspect that I find very often overlooked in this whole debate, which method is now most accurate in a certain regime, for cosmological structure formation, you should not forget that gravity is uh, extremely important. In fact, I would argue it is um, most important in many respects if you want to study galaxy formation and if you make an error in the gravity, that'll, uh, that'll screw your calculation base at some level <coughs> because most of the masses in the dark matter <coughs> in the collisionless component, only if you can simulate that accurately over a large dynamic range and follow the clustering accurately everywhere in the dominating mass component, you also have a chance that the, that the baryons basically do the right thing and cluster in the right objects. And here is a, a typical image from a cold dark matter simulation. You see that there is this cosmic web. There are large empty regions developing. There are filaments. Along the filaments, you have many, many you know, small halos, millions of them <coughs> of different sizes. And uh, you have extreme clustering um, in these calculations and the clustering is taking place everywhere on multiple scales. And that's uh, actually a, a, a nasty problem, especially a nasty problem if you have an AMR-based gravity solver because that's kind of similar to turbulence. You ideally would like to, result, we would like to refine it many, many places. Well, there are some large volumes that require low resolution, so you might still hope that you gain with AMR and that's true at some level. But the challenge here is to refine also early enough Right? If you have an AMR-based hierarchical gravity solver, you have to catch any tiny fluctuation that tries to go nonlinear and put a refinement onto this. And that's, that's actually a, a, a tough call with that method. And a gravitational tree code is, um, is, offers uniform accuracy everywhere and in that sense has some advantage. In the paper, I think Mike was about to show this, but, but skipped these slides in a, in a paper that we worked on with, with Brian O'Shea and also Lars Hönkes actually a few years ago. We compared the gravity solvers also um, non-reactive hydro between ENSO and Gadget. And there it showed, showed us that indeed, if you run ENSO or um, an AMR-based Poisson solver with sort of standard setups with a root grid that's of the order of the particle grid or maybe twice larger, and refinement criteria based on over density of sec factors of four or eight, then you, you find in this dark halo mass functions that you usually find a deficit of, of small objects unless you crank up basically your refinement criteria in your base grid, then you can recover the same result that you get with a parallel tree code, also with an AMR-based Poisson solver. But at that point, it requires actually um, pretty, you know, settings for these codes that are usually not adopted and they are quite expensive. So I just want to alert you to that, um, that this is something we should not, not forget and always keep an eye on. So you can... Yeah, this is a small slice of uh, 50 megaparsec. Uh, this is also roughly, you know, some of the voids are even bigger. That's why you see them. Yeah, I mean, if you would project the whole box, you would get projection, you know, you would see background structures in these voids. Mm -hmm. <coughs> actually, if you do a fly through, I have a movie of this where you fly through, then you see it's actually a lot of space is pretty empty. So the material is, most of the mass is assembling in a few percent of the volume. And the clustering is actually in that sense very extreme, right? Most of space is, is very low density. 
Um, there was another paper from the Los Alamos group where they have done code comparison with a larger range of set of codes in the dark matter. Again, you know, this is a, a bunch of uh, gravity solvers, including also the gravity, and, and they also tested basically gravity modules here in Flash, Enzo again, and a, a couple of other codes. And basically, again, you, you find here the same result that the, the mesh-based gravity solvers fall short compared to the other methods in the dark halo mass function. I think this is a problem that one should not, short, not ignore and should actually address. Um, and that's around even overdense regions here. This is, these are other plots that show basically deficit here of, of flash, um, which is I think the yellow one here. Uh, in, in different overdense regions, there's always a deficit of halos. And I think it's because basically you refine a bit too late. Right? You, you have to let the density contrast grow until you then discontinuously increase the gravitational resolution. And that's um, not an ideal thing to do, this discontinuous change in resolution for the gravitational instability problem. And because it's happening everywhere all over the place, that's, that's really the problem. So let me um, go over a couple of uh, you know, points that how, how I, where I see important differences between now Eulerian and Lagrangian approaches to hydrodynamics in cosmological structure formation problems. So this is really the angle there that I have on this, on this issue. And first of all, <coughs> your layering codes, they give you a superior treatment of, of shocks. Right? You get sharp shocks that are in the best schemes basically resolved in one cell. So this is extremely good. I mean, when the sh actually contact discontinuous are not, depending on how fast they move, are not as sharp. So it's not, it's not that all discontinuous are treated with that superior accuracy, right? The shocks are, in that sense, a bit, a bit easier. But SPH methods, in particular, they will always broaden these discontinuous over a couple of smoothing lengths. Like any other fluid feature, is just washed out. So this is a bad thing about the SPH methods. And I discussed at some level this mixing issue, which I suspect is behind some of the more serious differences that arise in results. You layering codes can treat mixing implicitly, essentially, at the cell level. That's <coughs> probably uh, the correct thing to do in many circumstances. <coughs> it has the danger that you sometimes do too much of that, of course, if you under-resolve. In the Lagrangian SPH, as I showed you, there is, uh, depending on the SPH formulation, there might be actually, a, a, but there is essentially complete suppression of mixing because there is no mixing entropy production accounted for in the standard approach. You only produce entropy in, through the artificial viscosity, and that's only triggered by a shock normally. And, but there are now the new suggestions are to, to basically fix this, this issue uh, with treatments you know, of discontinuity capturing also in the thermal energy equation. Maybe this can be get gotten to work. Um, artificial viscosity, as we already mentioned, just mentioned. So the ni well, another nice thing about learn methods, especially, the, well, the Godunov schemes, they actually don't need any artificial viscosity. Um, sometimes one still needs to, in certain scenarios, one still adds sometimes a bit of extra viscosity to, to tame some numerical uh, issues, but generally the viscosity, the artificial viscosity is, is extremely low. I mean, you can't, can't do better than that. While you need uh, an artificial viscosity in SPH, and the problem with that is, while this is, I think, perfectly okay to capture shocks, the problem with this is that it often, you know, makes the fluid viscous also outside of shocks, and that is, introducing errors that you don't want. <coughs> of course, there are ways to, to trying to minimize that, but this is always present at some level. Then you have this issue that uh, Jim al al already discussed, um, <coughs> that the truncation error in Eulerian schemes is not Galilean invariant. I'll, I'll get back to this later. <coughs> that uh, is something that's uh, not a, I would say it's not a, a principle, uh, it's not a deadly problem for the Eulerian codes in any, in any way because you, you always have a truncation error, of course. It just means you know, the truncation error, the size of it, depends a bit on your frame of reference. But if your simulation is, if the truncation error is small enough, then it doesn't matter that it depends on the frame of reference because then you're resolving your flow independent of the frame of reference. Problem is, however, that in cosmological simulations, you often um, can't guarantee this everywhere. There are flows that have very high Mach numbers and they will then be often track truncation error dominated. So this is, uh, in that sense, an unwanted property that produces errors sometimes in places where, where you have no control. You can't 
or you can't afford to beat it down by higher resolution. While Lagrangian schemes are Galilean invariant, so there this problem is basically absent by construction. That's a nice thing. And then finally, what I also find important in the context of structure formation, and I've just discussed it, is that um, the treatment of self-gravity, it's very natural to um, do the self-gravity of, of, uh, of the gas, of course, you must do it then on a mesh, but it's customary that also the dark matter uh, that you might also have around is then solved on the same mesh, and as I've just argued, this mesh-based Poisson solvers have problems to account for the strong clumping of dark matter, even in AMR, because of the problem that you have to refine at many places simultaneously, and that, that's computation expensive. And so I would argue it's actually would be more accurate to do something like a, uh, a, a parallel tree, a tree PM scheme to have a homogeneous high resolution everywhere in the dark matter. Self-gravity has also the nasty property that you don't explicitly conserve total energy anymore then, and that's uh, <coughs> also um, one of the you know, dirty laundry in, 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 in your learning approaches, that this is one nasty thing that, that is nobody really, as far as I know, has found a satisfying solution that, that manifestly conserves total energy, even in this case. While again, in Lagrangian uh, codes, this is uh, not an issue, so there you get this uh, more easily. And, you know, I show you results later where this actually sometimes matters. So what I now want to get to is to a, a different a hydrodynamic approach that kind of lies in, the in between. So this sort of comparison chart that I just showed you made me think whether I could not um, do something um, to essentially improve the Lagrangian treatment um, and, you know, inherit all the good things about the Lagrangian <coughs> schemes, by, by, but keeping the natural adaptivity of SPH to the clustering of matter. And that led uh, to a development of a new code um, called ARAPO that I've just finished a while ago. <coughs> and that is a, a moving, moving mesh hydrodynamic code. And I, I would like to tell you now more about this, um, why this is, is, is an interesting scheme, and, and also technically how this scheme actually works. So um, before I start, uh, just a few words on, on, uh, on this issue of Galilean invariance, because that's originally what, me, what motivated me, even so I think it's not as important as I uh, initially thought, in fact, in practice. So as Jim actually already explained, and I just can reiterate this, that the, the truncation error in the learning codes is not Galilean invariant. That's one way to, to view uh, or to explain why differences arise if you calculate a certain problem for certain initial conditions and you just give it a Galilean boost in some direction and then repeat the calculation. And you then get, if you, unless you have very good resolution, you might then find difference in your result. Here is a, a drastic example of that, where at low resolution, a kelvin helmholtz instability is simulated, where the contact discontinuity was put in with sharp boundaries. And if you then boost it, so you get nice kelvin helmholtz willows if you do this just in the rest frame of the, um, of the two fluids, this calculation. But if you boost this with once the sound speed in some direction, and you know this is periodic, so you can then make images again in the, in the co-moving frame, and then, in principle, nothing should have changed because the physics is Galilean invariant, but the, your numerical results changes. And if you make this, very, uh, this boost very, very large in this, in this problem, then you can render your calculation, you know, your final result very, uh, in, into a very different one. Now, it's um, quite, what I should say is that the, the higher resolution you have, the weaker these effects become. So we can always beat this down with better resolution. <coughs> And it also matters on whether your, initial, whether your initial conditions are actually well posed in the sense that they are resolved. Right? The contact discontinuity here was sharp, was sharp with arbitrarily short waves. They weren't quite resolved. That's, you know, normally one doesn't think about this, but in such a situation, you realize that this is actually, a, a, in that sense, an ill-posed problem for a mesh code because the initial condition contains waves that are, that are not really resolved. And that leads then to, um, you know, amplifies these problems. <coughs> And you can, as I said, uh, and uh, Jim just, uh, you know, has also shown this, that this is actually, if you, if you avoid that unresolved initial start, then uh, you can get this to be invariant, right? So this is more, uh, but nevertheless, I think it's, uh, it's an unwanted feature that you have these truncation errors that are uh, depending on your choice of reference frame. And you want one, one uh, lesson from this is that 
it makes sense to always choose the appropriate reference frame, as one naturally does, right? Because that the one where the fluid motions are minimized, because that will minimize the truncation errors that you have. And everyone does that. Now, why this, those of you who, who, who don't quite understand this invariance of truncation error, or why is the flux not Galilean invariant? I want to explain this, uh, trying to explain this with yet another, uh, another twist on the problem. And, and that gives also a hint about what one should do if one tries to get rid of that, if one tries to, for example, use Godunov schemes and try to make them um, Galilean invariant in the sense that you know, results will not depend on any of, of such boosts. Even the truncation errors, they, they are still present, but the size of them will then not depend on a Galilean boost. So for that, <coughs> let me remind you of uh, how the Godunov uh, scheme, scheme works, right? So you have, <coughs> There are basically the three steps, reconstruct, evolve, average. And um, we have a reconstruction step, for example, PPM or piecewise linear, where we then get at cell faces, we get a left and a right state. That's, that's obtained, for example, we have, say, maybe a cell boundary, density, pressure, velocity, uh, here normal to the face, and on the right. So we have these primitive variables here on the left and the right that describe the fluid. And then we solve a Riemann problem, and the Riemann problem is just uh, basically saying we, we solve now analytically what's going to happen. And analytically, this is what the Riemann problem is. It's the analytic solution, basically, of uh, the temporal evolution of such a piecewise continuous state. And then you get, for example, a, a shock tube problem if, um, if the velocities were initially zero, but of course you can have non-zero velocities. You can get all sorts of Riemann problem solutions. But generically, these, those are characterized by a, a set of self-similar waves. So basically from, <coughs> from this point, and this, this is often shown in such diagrams where you have a spatial coordinate and time coordinate, so emanating from your original coordinate x equal to zero, where your boundary is, you can have, for example, a shock wave running to the right, um, then a contact discontinuity in the middle, and then, for example, a rare rarefaction wave. Typically, you know, this contact discontinuity, this wave is sort of sandwiched between either two shock waves or two rarefactions or, or a mixture. And that's, that's generically the solution structure that you have. And these waves, they are self-similar. That You know, you can run them for uh, arbitrary times. So if you have solution at one time, you know, at any later time. And in the Godunov scheme, you basically sample the solution at the, f at the coordinate where your, your face is. So that's at x equal to zero. So whatever um, state of the fluid is predicted by the self-similar state, that's, say, the density rho f, pressure PF, VF, that's what you're going to use in your flux vector, right, for updating then uh, the conserved quantities in the cells. So the solution is sampled along sort of this sort of direction. And that's how, um, and then you, you uh, multiply the flux vector with your time step and you get the, the conserved changes in both cells. And then follows the up averaging step, and averaging is basically then here pretty uh, simple. You just, you know, add, add the conserved quantities together uh, and, and, you know, build basically the mass weighted average of that. <coughs> so, now coming to the, the problem of Galilean boost. So here again, this uh, diagram I just showed you. Now let's imagine we, we consider the same physics, f same physical problem in a Galilean boosted frame, right? And the f the, for example, let's just look at the mass flux. The mass flux would be the rho f I read off here times the vf. That's, that's my mass flux. Now, in a Galilean boosted frame, if I do a boost, say, um, of minus V, then, then I expect that, um, the <coughs> that only the velocity changes, right? The boost velocity will just be added to this. The pressure and the density will not change in a Galilean transformation. So, in the boosted frame, if I have a Galilean invariant solution, the, I would expect that the flux reads now rho F times Vf plus V. So that's my kind of my expectation. But in a Godunov scheme, I will not get this. Why not? Because in the boosted frame, you have now a different uh, left and right hand side. Actually, we'll have exactly this one, rho L, P, L, V, L plus V, and then rho R, P, R, V, R plus V. And then you do your Riemann problem. And now the Riemann problem is again, in a sense, Galilean invariant, of course. You get the same waves as before, but they are now kind of tilted to the right because you added to all of them a constant velocity. What this, however, means is since your reference frame is still at rest, or is, 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 you, know, you 
will sample again at x equal to zero constant, as x equal to zero constant is your phase boundary. So you sample along this direction and you read off from the Riemann problem here a different density and a different pressure p star. And you can already at that level see that you can never get a Galilean invariant solution because this product now that you put into the flux vector, rho f star, p f star, this is your flux component in the mass, is not equal to this in general. So this is already basically a proof. Um, you can convince yourself with variant, you know, count examples where basically this is equality is actually violated, that this can't be Galilean invariant. Of course, in the, in the language of um, differentiation, you can also show that this is actually the means effectively that uh, the truncation error has, has changed in, in the two frames. Now, What do you mean with the correct flux? So do you say this is equal? Yes. No, I disagree. <laughs> Why is it not equal? In the Riemann solver, it gives you the correct sample solution. Yeah, it's the correct sample solution, right? But I can show you, say, let's, let's suppose you have, um, why, is that, why is that not equal? Suppose you, you um, have a contact discontinuity here in the beginning, okay? Let's suppose we have a contact discontinuity in the beginning where the velocity is zero, okay? Then this flux, the, this flux will be zero because the velocity is zero across, across it, all right? And then, <coughs> and then you um, add your Galilean boost and then the, fl the flux that you're now going to get is basically upwinded state on the, on the whatever left side, the density times the boost velocity, right? But if you turn the boost around, you, you get the opposite sign with the different density on the other side, right? Well, we can... I, yes, but... Look, this solution is still Galilean variant, right? But the, the, f the mass flux that you put into the cell has now changed because you, you pick a particular averaging frame for that in the end. That's what it boils down to. We can go through the macro... Yeah, but you expect exactly this flux. That's the point. If you change a reference, you expect this flux, rho f times vf plus v. That's what you expect. But I'm saying if you read this flux off here, you're not going to get this, depending on where you are in this wave structure. Yeah. I mean, there is a difference in general. It's the, it's in the low star again. Yeah. I mean, what's right or wrong? This is, this is right. I mean, you, for this Riemann problem, this is right, right? Yeah. But be, you, you are just, um, because you have crossed, you know, in, in some sense, because your sampling has crossed one of these waves, you're now sampling a different, different piece of the fluid, right? And that's the reason why, for example, you know, if you um, have just a plain advection, for example, advection, advection problem, right, if, if you, that's why I mentioned the contact. If you're in the frame of reference where the contact is addressed, you, nothing changes and your result stays correct. But if the thing starts to move, you're going to start averaging things. And it's not because uh, you make any error in the Riemann problem. The Riemann problem is always solved exactly. Right? But you're now averaging different pieces of the solution together. Right? If, for example, the contact ad is advected over the cell. You start to average it together. So the error kind of happens. The solutions are Galilean and rent until you average the new states together. But that's what you're doing by, by basically integrating over the, the volume and then accounting for just the fluxes uh, at the surfaces for the conserved states. Okay. So we can go through numerical examples where I show you this. But this is, this is basically, so what you ideally would like to have is you would like to sample the state of the fluid somewhere in here, like before. But you can't really do this because that would violate sort of the, the upwinding nature. You would then make a, you would become unstable if you just did this, right? <coughs> you have to um, follow the normal structure in the Godunov problem. So, 
<coughs> so that is just as a remark, and I invite you to think about it and prove me wrong on this if you don't believe me. Now the repo code is, um, so that's actually the, well, coming back maybe to this point, so what, what you ideally would like to do is to sample again the state here, and you can only do this if you now basically, your, your face is actually moving along this direction. And that suggests, okay, if I have a moving mesh code where the face is moving along that, I will always get the same, the same uh, flux, you know, um, independent of my, my, the frame of reference of my calculation. And that's what uh, you can achieve if you let the, uh, the mesh, conceptually we would like to let the mesh move with the flow. And in 1D, this is of course uh, uh, an old concept that uh, works also very well. You know, in Lagrange and hydrodynamics in 1D is pretty simple to do. And there you just move your cells with the flow. And um, that is, uh, is, is great. But in, in multi-dimensions, uh, it's, it's harder. And I show you here an approach that actually works. The traditional hardness in that letting the mesh move is that <coughs> <coughs> you will have twisting of mesh cells. Uh, not sure why it's now not playing smoothly. Yeah. Yes, the number of cells is conserved here. Yeah, the, um, there are gradients inside the cells, yeah. Well, this shows just the, the, the color shows you the linear reconstruction that the code did, okay? That's the gradient that you see here. That's why there are color gradients inside cells if you look, look at this sharply. So I'm not sure why this was so slow. Let me show you this once more. If you look closely, you will see how individual cells, especially in the shearing layer, how they change their geometry. But the um, important feature of this mesh, mesh motion is that the uh, mesh cells are not sheared apart and there's no mesh twisting and no generation of bow tie cells. That's the traditional sort of Achilles heel of uh, moving on uh, mesh codes is that uh, if you have a certain mesh topology initially and you start to let it move, the individual cells will change the geometry to a point when you, when you don't allow for reconnections and changes of the topology will um, get very nasty behavior where you get uh, cells essentially that get, get very thin or are twisted and at that point your, pro your code either crashes or you have to do a, a regridding on the fly which is a diffusive operation and it's not easy to do this, do this in a nice way. Now this uh, approach as you've just seen actually can, <coughs> can avoid this <coughs> and you, you get a very uh, Nice behavior. Here's actually the same Kelvin Helmholtz problem now, again with the moving mesh code at much higher resolution with um, 1,000 um, cells in the horizontal and 700 on the vertical. And this was now seeded with random noise and so you get Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities developing. <coughs> and again, this is with the moving mesh approach. And what's um, particularly interesting about this is that you can, as you see here, you can advect these uh, you know, complicated contact discontinuities of, of partially mixed fluid with reasonable speeds through space, <coughs> with avoiding that there's additional excessive mixing occurring. Right? So this would be very hard to do <coughs> with a Eulerian mesh, the same resolution, these things would be uh, basically blurred and would be entirely mixed together. <coughs> So that's um, quite nice. So turbulence is developing, obviously, here. You can, uh, this is another problem that shows <coughs> a point explosion here. So here you see nicely how the mesh uh, is deformed <coughs> and is following the uh, motion of the gas in the same way as SPH would do, basically, right? So you have here, I've injected a lot of thermal energy in one cell in the center, <coughs> and you get a circle blast wave. This is here in 2D. <coughs> and the mesh is compressed um, here now in the corners. Actually, these shock waves hit basically other shock waves because here periodic boundaries were, were used. But you see that actually uh, the mesh follows quite nicely this concentration here of the mass now in the corner. You get the little backsplash. This is all at relatively low resolution. And <coughs> this is just an example that to show you that you can follow actually um, 
large density contrast and, and quite robustly how, how the mesh moves around with this moving mesh approach. Um, you're the expert in this, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> What's that? Perhaps, well, I, don't, I, 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 I've, I haven't thought about it. Um, or let me, or Rayleigh Taylor instability, this was also, this also seeded here with ra random noise, just to show you a bit more, you know, how the mesh moves around. This was actually with an early incarnation of this code, so I can do this better these days with the current version, where the boundaries are treated better, the reconstruction is better, and also the mesh geometry. But you s we see here there are, <coughs> there are solid walls, now solid boundaries here, periodic boundaries on the left and right. How this stuff sort of starts to mix, <coughs> how, how turbulence develops, and how you know, the mesh stays um, regular. And you, know, you can also do this at high resolution. Nice Rayleigh Taylor fingers developing, and uh, secondary carbon hemorrhoids, instabilities, and so on. Nice transition to turbulence. <coughs> <coughs> so this is um, with a new moving mesh code. And so I would like to tell you now how this code works, because it's actually a pretty elaborate, of, it's right away it's clear that the, that the key to this code, the most nasty thing here is the mesh itself. The rest is using the techniques that, that Jim described, basically. <coughs> so what I'm using here is a so-called Voronoi tessellation, a Voronoi mesh. <coughs> and you see an example for this here on the left. The Voronoi mesh is uh, a very interesting and simple mathematical construction. It's basically the most fundamental and basic geometric construction you can do with a set of points in space. And mathematically, the Voronoi uh, space or the Voronoi tiles of each point is just uh, cons consist of all the points that are closest to a given particular point, closer than to any other point. That's how um, a Voronoi tessellation is defined, and you can define this in 2D, 3D, 1D, any dimension. And that definition also makes it clear that the faces of the cells, you know, are sort of the, you know, in are midway between two points always, and at right angles to the connection between two points. And then there is another very interesting geometric construction, the Deloney triangulation, <coughs> that is, uh, has a close relationship to the Voronoi mesh. <coughs> and for the same points here in this box, this shows the Deloney triangulation. So a triangulation is, well, what it says, uh, a set of triangles that make uh, tessellate space. And there are many different possible triangulations. <coughs> and the Deloney triangulation is, interestingly, a new, unique triangulation, which has one interest, particular property, namely that the circumcircle around each of the triangles does not contain any other point. And that property, this empty circumcircle property, is actually determining the Deloney triangulation uni uniquely. And with that property, um, then these two tessellations are related. They're actually the topological dual to each other, meaning that <coughs> for, every, for every face in the Voronoi mesh, there is an edge in the Deloney triangulation. Right? You see this here overlaid. If you look at uh, a Voronoi cell, then there are edges of the triangulation that are just orthogonal always to the edges. So basically, for example, if you want to have all the faces around the point, you look at all the Deloney triangles around the point, and each of the edge is giving you a face, and vice versa. Why is this important? So what, I s what you saw already in the movie is that it's this <coughs> construction I'm using for the moving mesh, <coughs> but it turns out that algorithmically, it's much faster to construct the Deloney triangulation. Once you have it, then you have already constructed the Voronoi mesh because it's the topological dual. You get this for free. So basically, they are equivalent. Also, for storage purposes, uh, the data structures here are regular, right? You have triangles with, with a fixed set of points, so this is easy to store. While the, these polygons here, they have a variable number of faces. Right, this is already bad for storing that. It's much more complicated. So you're better off storing this structure. So they are the duals to each other, and there is uh, a whole slew of mathematical uh, theorems known about these two triangulations, which is quite interesting. So we would like to use such a mesh now generated. So the idea is we throw in a few points into space, and that makes a mesh, right? Build it, makes the Voronoi mesh, and on top of this Voronoi mesh, we now want to describe a finite volume hydrodynamical scheme based on Godunov's approach where 
the meshes are also allowed to, to move. And that is uh, what we've seen many times now, uh, and I've only discussed the uh, ordinary Euler equations here. So we have a, a conservation laws for the, f for the conserved states, <coughs> mass, momentum, and total energy. This is the state vector of our fluid. And then there is a flux vector here and an equation of state. <coughs> <coughs> then we might make the usual finite volume ansatz that we describe each cell with um, a volume integral over its interior conserved state of the fluid. So that gives you just a, a total mass in a cell, a total momentum, and a total energy in the cell. For that uh, uh, vector of conserved variables, you can then get the evolution equation from this by uh, with the uh, usual trick to cast the uh, volume integral over the divergence into surface integral, and you get this. The only difference here is now in this surface integral that I've included a term here that describes actually the motion of the surface. Because in general, the surface doesn't have to be fixed. The surface can also move, and then you get an additional flux through the surface here. And that's something that we'll want to exploit. In fact, in a truly Lagrangian code, you would pick this W, the fluid velocity on the, you would make the velocity of the phase of the outer boundary of a cell, you would make it equal to the velocity of the fluid. If you do that, then immediately the mass inside a cell stays constant, right? In three dimensions. Yeah, of, of course. Yeah, yeah. The Brownian mesh exists in three. I get to this. So in three dimensions, it's, I use only these diagrams in two dimensions because you get all the concepts. Three dimensions, it's, as you can imagine, the Brownian cells are a bit harder to, to visualize and wrap your brain around them. It's, it's harder. Um, in, well, in, 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 yeah, there are diagrams here like the Deloney triangulation, I think, maximizes the minimum angle that ever occurs in a triangle. Something. There are a couple of theorems. They are not going to be terribly important for what I'm going to say now. So. But in three dimensions, I don't quite know. There, um, one has to look that up, yeah. But like in the Deloney, I think there's a property that I think it, this is the one triangulation that maximizes the minimum angle that occurs among the triangles, something like that. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, so this is the evolution equation, and we basically know that the, the only new thing is this term, right? We'll, we'll have to exploit. And then <coughs> what we now basically do is, well, we just apply the usual um, ideas of uh, the Godin of finite volume approach. So we have a cell, and we'd like to work out all the fluxes on over the edges of the cell. Now the uh, new thing here is that a cell is basically, the, the geometry of the mesh is created by coordinates of a set of points. Here is a, the mesh generating point of that cell. There's the mesh generating point of that cell. And the freedom we're going to have is that we can let these points move essentially with arbitrary velocities, right? So we can make them in particular, we can set the velocity zero, then we have a, a static unstructured mesh. Actually, we can also put a Cartesian mesh if we make these points a regular grid, then we have a Cartesian mesh. But this is gen generalized base. So what we want to have is the flux over this phase here. And <coughs> what we need to do is we somehow need to calculate for Godinov schemes, we need to have some sort of reconstruction step and then um, predict what's the, the left and the right state going to be across this phase. Then we put this into a Riemann solver. We get the base the state on the phase and we use that to evaluate our flux vector. What we have to take into account in this is basically how this phase moves. And actually, you can now work out how this sort of, say, the normal speed W of the phase, that you can show depends on the velocities of the mesh generating points, those two and the other. So it's uniquely specified once you have the velocities of the mesh generating points. <coughs> yes, but you could put an HLL, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So for a Eulerian gas, the exact one with three, four iterations, you get the solution. So it's not a serious source of sink of CPU time. You can put in a, 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 an other Riemann solver. I'm at the moment using exact one because I found it simplest to, to check some of the things I'm getting. But um, that's not a crucial point. You can put in, I think all the form, all the machinery of that's um, 
being developed can probably also work here with uh, approximate remand solvers and so on. What one dimension? Sorry, what? How, how do you do your reconstruction? Of the mesh? Yes, uh, the, the reconstruction, yeah, I, I, I'll get to this in a second. Yes, okay. <clears throat> now, more about this. So, what basically we need to know is the, the velocity of the phase in the, in, the, in the frame, or we need to, for each phase, we need to know the velocities. And, you know, you basically can calculate that. You can both calculate the total range change of volume of a cell due to the motion of all the mesh generating points. You can also calculate this velocity w prime here with some geometry, and it's um, not so easy to prove this, but it's. Um, no, you need it's only to to linear order basically. I mean, it depends on how many Gauss points you want to put on the on the phase. At the moment, I, I neglect for that the turning of the phase. You, you need basically need to calculate it in the center of mass of the phase. That's sufficient at, to second order accuracy. So what you need to do, and that was the question just uh, about the gradient uh, and the uh, linear reconstruction. So basically, uh, <coughs> what you have in, in 1D, what you would have is, you know, a bunch of piecewise continuous states first, but you this is not good enough, would give you low order at the boundaries, and, and Jim actually described this. But how do you generalize this uh, to higher, uh, or to unstructured, weird polygonal, polyhedral cells, based in three dimension? And, and one way, so what you need to first do is basically estimate gradients, and you can't do just finite differencing, because the cells all have different weird shapes and so on, so in different distances. That wouldn't be uh, good enough. So you somehow need for a raw noise cell a gradient operation that gives you um, a reasonably good estimate for the gradient, which you can then slope limit to get a, a lin uh, reconstruction. And uh, what I use here is Green-Gauss gradient estimation. This is a relatively simple technique. It uses the Green-Gauss theorem, right? If you, which says um, one of these things says that the volume integral of a gradient is equal basically to the surface integral of this field um, with the normal vector here, uh, n points, points outwards on, this, on the surface. So that means if you want an estimate of the gradient, the mean gradient in a cell, you can calculate this by the, doing a, a surface integral of this and dividing by the volume, averaging this. And that's actually what you can do. You can show that you can calculate the surface integral from the, the values of the fields in the cell I and the, and the neighboring fields and the coordinates of the mesh generating points. So this, um, what you, what you can do, and you can derive this. So then you have gradient estimates, <coughs> and then you need to slope limit this somehow, because the gradient estimates, for example, say at this point might be something like this, and you would then add, or here, you would add a new a extrema here, a minimum that gives you this uh, ringing and unwanted behavior. So you need to slope limit uh, the reconstruction, and I use here a, a simple slope meaning procedure where you, where you basically determine them the minimum and maximum around your cell in our neighboring cells, and, and you don't allow the extrapolated gradient to any of the cell boundaries to overshoot this minimum uh, or this maximum. So this is uh, what this gives you then is a, a slope-limited piecewise linear reconstruction in each, each cell that's conservative. So you put this onto the center of mass, for example, of a cell for the density, and then you have something that's conservative, even though uh, the cell shape is... is <coughs> is you know, some weird polygonal shape. So you have to use then the center of, of, of this center of gravity basically of this area. Uh, that's the center for the reconstruction. And now let me go through the steps then how a hydrodynamical step would look like. So assume that you need to calculate uh, here the flux over, over this phase. So the first thing is you do uh, a transformation of your fluid state and primi primitive variables um, both for the left and the right state, into the, the frame of the phase. Right? And that's actually what th makes this thing then not later Galilean invariant, that you can do this here. And then <coughs> you linearly predict forward. Uh, first of all, you, you take your gradient estimates and evolve them, predict forward in time by half a time step with the Euler equation, and you um, extrapolate with your gradient from the center of, of mass to the, the midpoint of the phase here. 
So this is basically both the half-step time prediction and the uh, spatial uh, extrapolation of the linear reconstruction. Uh, this prediction you can do with the Euler equations um, sort of in a pseudo-linearized form in, <coughs> in primitive variable form. This is sort of a muscle-like scheme. Actually, what I'm describing here, it was generalized to this unstructured mesh. Then you need to <coughs> rotate the state of the fluid such that you look at the normal component to the phase. So this is simply a rotation matrix. And then you solve the Riemann problem in this rotated state, <coughs> in this normal problem. Then you transform the solution back to the calculational frame. So you undo the trans, you undo the rotation and you undo the, the, the boost into the uh, rest frame of the phase. And once you have that, then you can calculate the net flux in the, in the calculational frame with this equation. Once you have that, you do for all the phases. <coughs> and then you can update the conserved variables in each cell like this. You, know, you just sum the fluxes times the areas times the time step over the phases. That gives you your new conserved state in the, you can do the next time step. So that's sort of the sequence of things you, you have to do. And this scheme is, well, it's Galilean invariant if the W that you have, <coughs> that's the, if that's tied to the fluid's motion. <coughs> Basically, one simple way to do this is <coughs> if you um, move the mesh generating points with the velocity of, this, of the flow in that cell. That's sort of the simplest, most natural way to do this. And then you achieve quasi-Lagrangian behavior it's only quasi-Lagrangian because you still have mass flux. You can still have mass flux over the phase. You can't, you can't simultaneously you know, guarantee that all the velocity field will be zero at all the edges. The, that is not possible, but you um, can minimize, if you wish, the mass flux across the cells that way. About twice as many. You have an think for, um, let's see, if in a normal phase in a 3D Cartesian grid, you have basically six phases on a, on a cube. On average, in 3D, you have about 12 and a half phases, I think. That's what I remember, something like this. I think it's a, f maybe it's a fact of 2.4 instead of two, I, I, I keep forgetting, but it's about that. So yeah, there is a much higher cost, actually, but that is not what should scare you in that, oh, you have to do more Riemann problems. They're actually pretty fast. So that, if that's the only thing, that would not, would not be concern me at the slightest. Okay. But we'll have to, I get to this, what you should be concerned about at this point of my talk is, oh my God, what is this mesh construction going to be? That will be very difficult to do. I don't think this will gain you much. But I haven't tried this, so it's a possibility. Um, well, just to show you, before I get to some more results, let me show you some primitive shock tubes, really, where I point out some of the <coughs> things that, that such a moving mesh approach will give you. Um, and it shows you both advantages and disadvantages. So it will be able, hopefully, to treat um, shocks as well as you learn approach. I see some ringing here. It's actually in, well, in newer version of the code, I've, I've gotten rid of this, but you know, it's pretty good still. So it, th there's a shock resolved roughly with the same number of cells as in your learning code, but it does better in the contact, basically. Right? That, that's sharper by, and the, con the contact is washed out uh, depending on how fast this moves in your learning code. And then you also get in the entropy some errors because of um, the mixing that in that case is, not, is unwanted, basically. So you can do, primarily you can do contacts better. Better. But if you have, uh, there are also regions where, where it's going to do worse, right? If you, for example, have very strong rarefactions, then your cell resolution will degrade, right? Because the mass is moving out, and if your mesh is following the mass, then there are no mesh points left. So here's, for example, a very strong, this case, action isothermal double rarefaction test. <coughs> and in the moving mesh, you see that. Here the density is, well, it's, it's following in the wings pretty well, but in the center there are actually no points left to sample the flow, right? So they have your huge cells there. It's not doing so good. In a Eulerian code, you will do better here. In SPH, this is the result you would get. Similar behaviors in the moving mesh code, but of course, overall worse accuracy. But you can do with the moving mesh code in 1D, there's a 1D test uh, of this um, 
Woodward Colella's double blast wave problem, a bunch of very strong shocks interacting, going back and forth over this computational domain a few times. You see that moving mesh calculation with the same number of points initially, and this is a second order Eulerian scheme. Um, you are able to pre preserve some of these sharp contacts much better than in a Eulerian approach. So in principle, there is some, uh, some um, nice uh, accuracy benefit in principle lurking there. Now let's look at multi-dimensions. That's really where things get more complicated. Here is a, a Gresho <coughs> vortex problem. So this is, in principle, the analytic solution of this <coughs> rotating vortex is uh, um, stationary. So this thing should rotate for a long time. <coughs> and it you know, does so with the moving mesh. This is at low, low resolution. Of course, you um, have some degradation of the solution with time. But overall, you can run this for, for a decent amount of time. And the results are, in fact, uh, uh, as good, basically, as with, with a Eulerian code. In fact, my code, if I uh, run Athena in second order for this problem, then uh, my code does as well as Athena on this particular problem if I use a fixed mesh. But the nice, so this is for a static uh, vortex where uh, these three codes were, you know, this wrapper code with a fixed mesh to Athena where uh, only a second order scheme was used, not the higher order schemes. So that's only second order. So they should be equivalent, and they are. So I was very pleased when I could reproduce Athena because uh, I think it's a very, really great code. Um, so I, I can reproduce the second order hydrodynamics uh, in, in such a simple problem. It's of course not MHD, this is ordinary hydro. And also the moving mesh is equally good for that, right? But the advantage you have is if the vortex is now moving with some velocity, then the moving mesh calculation stays the same. Right? The result doesn't change. So if you have a, a vortex roll and it's in some turbulent calculation and it decides to move a bit, then the accuracy is not degraded in the moving mesh code. That's a nice feature. While in the Eulerian approaches, you have some development of asymmetry, not particularly severe, but it's also not not, uh, not exact, not, you know, in principle, unwanted. <coughs> and, you know, the convergence rates are reproduce, reproduce those in, in Athena, in this case, <coughs> for that problem. What's also interesting is um, three-dimensional simulations, of course, with gravity. So I'll get to uh, the problem of mesh construction in the schemes in a minute. <coughs> and I want to just point out one, one, one of the issues uh, in 3D problems, if you couple now things to gravity, there is one very popular um, test problem for, for SPH codes around, where you have just a cold gas sphere initially with some density profile. And then at time zero, you let it collapse under its own self-gravity, and it's going to collapse to the center, and then uh, a strong <coughs> virilization shock develops a bounce back, basically, that eventually virilizes the thing. And in 3D, since there's a substantial change in dynamic range, and you have, you know, follow the collapse for a while. This is non-native, so not, not for you know, to huge density contrast, but moderately large density contrast. This is a challenging problem in 3D, and that's sort of the evolution of the temperature. And this is, as I said, very often used uh, in SPH. This is, for example, an SPH result here. The compared to a, an analytic, well, pseudo-analytic solution, I should say. This is a high accuracy um, PPM calculation in one dimensions done by Steinmetz and Müller. This is here in red. So that is probably very close to the exact result. <coughs> and then you can compare that with when you do this calculation at the same initial resolution, same number of cells, cell points in this spherical radius initially, <coughs> <coughs> with a fixed Cartesian mesh, with SPH, or with this moving mesh. And this is at pretty low resolution. But you see that in a fixed mesh, unsurprisingly, you're not getting a lot of cells in the center. So you can't actually reproduce the inner density structure very well. Um, here is the shock at this point. And in this low resolution, you actually the shock comes out a bit earlier then. That's why it's a bit offset to the analytic solution. In SPH, you get this result here. So you have, because of the adaptivity of SPH, and that's what we are often after in cosmology, you get points now at high density it's sort of Lagrangian, and so you, you resolve the inner density structure much better. And here you would need AMR to do this, basically. But the shock is broadened, and if you look at the shock structure, you see another interesting effect. In front of the shock in SPH, you see here in the entropy profile, 
that the numerical so resol uh, solution shows a lot of entropy production ahead of the shock. So where's this coming from? That's because this flow is spherically symmetric and here the density is already going up rapidly, so there is a strong compression here, but that's still adiabatic, this compression. So you shouldn't change the entropy here, but in SPH, due to the artificial viscosity, this does happen. Right? So it's a, an error. Now the moving mesh, unsurprising, does better here, right? It will only generate the entropy now with the Riemann solver here, and it does better also in reproducing the other features here. And as I said, this time offset here is due to the low resolution. If you increase the resolution just a bit, you get this on top of the red, um, red curve. And the other interesting thing here is that um, when I studied this problem with the, uh, with the moving mesh code first, I had, s and I looked at the conservation of total energy, there I came across this issue that under self-gravity in, in a mesh, you have, uh, it's not so easy to conserve total energy. In fact, I got energy errors of, of the order of 10, 15, 20%, and I couldn't get rid of them. And then I just Googled a bit on the web, and I found, for example, this um, analysis of, of the Everard problem by, by Colin McNally. I don't really know this fellow, but uh, he, he wrote up a, uh, you know, a little piece on, on results, and this is a plot from, uh, from his work, and I, I'm, you know, I can't guarantee that this is the, the final word, what you can achieve with flash, but he pointed out that with, with flash on this problem, you also get a, an energy error here of 7% or so in the total energy, which is surprisingly large, given that fact that in SPH you get basically zero energy error there, right? So and it's very actually hard to get rid of this energy error. Here are, uh, you can get rid of it with higher resolution. If you resolve it better in a mesh code, it's, this energy error is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. <coughs> so here's an example with a sort of uh, off-the-shelf way of to couple the gravitational field into the mesh. Then you see with, resol with increasing resolution, so at low resolution, the energy error is huge. 40% here even, and then it drops and drops with higher and higher resolution. But I've devised in my paper on this code, I've devised a couple of other ways. All of them are not completely satisfactory how you can couple the, the uh, gravitation work term differently to the fluid. And I think it's probably possible to, uh, well, it's possible to do better also by just changing this coupling. So this is another point one should pay attention to if you have self, strongly self-gravitating uh, hydrocodes on meshes that you pay attention to how you precisely couple the gravitation work terms into the fluid. Because I think, I suspect that many of the codes that are on the market are, are using something more akin to this, not, not something more akin to this. Just to point, point this out. So, but now I want to spend some time on this interesting topic on how to construct a Voronoi mesh. Obviously, this is something that you have to tackle on, on this particular moving mesh approach. And there are different algorithms to uh, construct the Deloney triangulation, uh, as I said, that's really what you want to do to make a Deloney mesh rapidly and quickly and robustly. And when if you're able to do this, you have the Voronoi mesh for free. There in 2D, there are different algorithms, um, divide and conquer, <coughs> sequential insertion sweep line algorithm, projection of uh, 3D convex hull to 3D. I'll, uh, so divide and conquer is actually the fastest, so this is doing what it says. You subdivide your point set until you have essentially three points left. You make a triangle, and then you're trying to connect the pieces again with some algorithm. That's a very elegant way to do it, and it's, and it's the fastest way known in 2D. Problem is, this can't be channelized easily to 3D, or it's very hard to do that, actually, because you can't, you can't join two triangulations easily along some boundary. So I'll focus later on the sequential insertion also for the fact that this is a method that can be generalized to 3D and still works quite well there. The other method that is <coughs> generalizable is this projection of a 3D convex hull that exploits some theorems from computational geometry. So if basically this convex, this projection method means that you add a third coordinate in 2D, which is basically x squared plus y squared, this r squared, and then you expand the point set to three uh, dimensional space, basically this means that you lift your points onto a paraboloid in 3D, and if you ca calculate a convex hull on that three-dimensional object and project it to two dimensions, then you get back the Deloney triangulation. So this is a general theorem that holds in any dimension, and there is an algorithm Q hull for calculating uh, the convex hull that's very efficient, and one can basically do that in this lifted higher dimensional space and with the projection technique then make it in any dimension. So in fact, this method is the one that works in any dimension, and if you have 
you know, higher dimensional Delaunay meshes, then this is really what you need to do. All the other methods, they become intractable, basically, because they are geometrically too messy. So I'm go going to show you how a sequential insertion works. This has three steps. You basically find, <coughs> uh, with a point location method, you find that you, you start out with a constructed Delaunay triangle that's correct, and you want to add another point to it. And you do that by, that's the uh, sequential insertion, uh, so you, you find first the triangle in which this point lies, you split this triangle, and then you heal the Delaunay triangulation. If it's not Delaunay, then in the environment. And if you manage that, then you're done, and you can insert the next point. Another issue that I'll going to get to is the, uh, that's actually what makes things really uh, t tough at times, is the problem that all the, if you lead, lead read literature about this, you'll find that most of the applied math people that discuss algorithms, they will assume general, the so-called general precision assumption for your points. So what that means is that, in, for example, in 2D, the assumption is that they effectively that a point set is sufficiently unordered that you never have cases where more than three points lie on a common circumcircle. So, and it generously occurs if you have, for example, four points on a square, because here <coughs> you have a circle that goes through all four points, and you then don't know, should you make a triangulation where the diagonal goes from top left to top bottom right or this way? So there are two possibilities. They are both Delaunay valid, and in that case it's degenerate, and there is a tie, basically, that we have to break consistently. Unfortunately, this breaking of the ties uh, I should say the Delaunay triangulation in this case is not unique, but the, the, the Voronoi tessellation still is. It doesn't matter basically how you break the tie, but what matters is that you do this consistently because your algorithm, as I show you, will, will crash if you do ever uh, make a mistake in this. Right? Unfortunately, making mistakes here due to floating point accuracy is, is quite common. And for example, if you put down a Cartesian grid initially, you have ties all over the place, right? and it's very hard to, to, to get rid of them. So just how does this algorithm work? So again, we have a, a valid Delaunay triangulation, and we want to insert this red point into it. So you have to locate this triangle in which the point lies, and then what you do is very simple. You split this triangle into three triangles like this. At that point, you have a new triangulation. But this triangulation might not be Delaunay now, because in particular, these edges here might violate the Delaunay hood, and so you need to check now the new triangles whether their circumcircles contains another point. So that's how you do it. You construct a circumcircle, and you need to check whether this point is inside or outside. So this one's outside, so this is okay. This edge is correct. It will be in the final Delaunay triangulation. In this triangle, you find that the circumcircle contains this point. So this is an invalid point. And at that point, you need to do something to the mesh. You need to change, you, and you, do, you flip this invalid edge that you added, or that has become now invalid through to this no new point. You flip it. That means you just turn it around in this quadrilateral, like this. At that point, you need to check now these new triangles again, right? So this first one that it just generated, I need to check it. If this point is OK. Check the other one, this is also OK. Check this one, this is not OK. I need, again, to flip the edge. So I flip it like this. Then I check the, the, this new triangle here. This point is now OK. This is OK, and I'm done. This is how you do that. Actually, and you can do this, and that's maybe the real surprise. You can do this really quickly. No, you, you can parallelize it, but it's... Uh, Yes, sequential on each core. What you do, you parallelize it with domain decomposition. So you need to, each match, each processor works on one spatial region to make the mesh. So I parallelize this by, I actually incorporate ghost points. And then you have a complete mesh patch locally. And for that, it's a sequential algorithm. Yeah. But don't you have to then adjudicate across those patches? Yes, the, the, there is an overlap. The ghost regions have to overlap sufficiently. That's actually algorithmically hard to guarantee that, but that's, you can do it, yeah. And if you use something like uh, domain decomposition with sort of piano Hilbert curves or so, you can make basically the surface area, the volume in this ghost region small compared to the total volume. That regime, it's, it's scaling. 
What? No. No, that's, um, yeah, that's a, a good question. So how, in what, basically, what the question basically is, in, in what order do you insert the point, right? <coughs> so actually, initially, you start with one big triangle and you insert the first point. <coughs> this, this big triangle is a fiducial triangle. You insert the first point, but you insert, I insert the points in a special order along a space filling curve again because the next point I insert is then close to my previous point and that means I already know basically in which triangle I am or I'm very close and you then find the new insertion point by a walk procedure. You walk through the tessellation towards the new point but normally you hop only along one or two triangles so that's how you locate the point very efficiently. It's basically no time. If you have ordered the points up front <coughs> If you do it randomly, which you can do, then you have sort of another log n sort of piece that you have to walk many steps to find the insertion triangle. Of course, you can do this also in 3D. <coughs> so in 3D, you work with tetrahedra instead of triangles. So you have tetrahedra, <coughs> and there <coughs> the point insertion means so-called one to four flip. You have a tetrahedron and you find the point inside and then you change it to four tetrahedra. So that's straightforward. But what's harder is to <coughs> do then the flips. The flips are now here replacements of two tetrahedra with three or back. Right? So this is uh, what you normally have to do. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, this is all you need if you have really fulfilled uh, the general position assumption. But if there are degenerate cases, then especially the 3D case gets more complicated <laughs> because what can happen is that the new point that you insert might lie exactly on an edge of a tetrahedron. And then you have to do a one to n flip, <coughs> depending on how many tetrahedra are around this edge. <coughs> if the new point lies exactly on a face, you have to do a two to six flip. And then there are also degenerate cases where you have to do four to four flips. I'll, I'll show you those here. So this is getting um, pretty complicated. So if you have, for example, here the two to six flip, if your new point lies on a face, and you have to split basically this top, tr top tetrahedron into three and the bottom one into three as well. Anyway, it gets sufficiently complicated. But <coughs> you can actually program this up. And that's what I'm thinking. What I've done, but it took me a while. But the one problem I, I, I encountered was that uh, there are these problems of degeneracy, as I mentioned. This is actually a, not only a technic, this is a basic technicality, but a hard one to, to get right. And for example, we have these decisions to make. Is, for example, a new point, is a new point exactly on this edge here or is it inside the left or the right triangle? And now if you think, oh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's close enough, if it's below a machine epsilon, then, I don't know, will some random decision will be made, right? The problem is that, indeed, it will be pretty much random if it's below machine precision. But the next time you do an in-circle test and so on, you will make inconsistent decisions that are not commensurate with the actual geometry you have due to round-offs that are not, that essentially at some level stochastic and it will make your algorithm break down, I can guarantee you. It's impossible to overcome with uh, somehow epsilon checks and so on. It's basically impossible to overcome. And so what you have to do to really deal with these degenerate cases is that you have to detect when is my round-off error large enough that I might make um, that I might make a mistake. So the solution to this is that you calculate while you're making these geometric predicate tests, you calculate the maximum round of error in geometric tests and check whether you might make a wrong decision. And usually these geometric tests boil down to evaluating signs of determinants, basically. If the determinant is um, and you know, if it's 10 to the minus 14 or so, and then you could as well get minus 10 to the minus 15 or something. So if it's close to zero determined then you might get either sign and you have to check then uh, you have to evaluate the correct sign in fact or test whether maybe it's really zero in a degenerate case and the only way that I found to be reliable is that you in these cases you actually you need to use some sort of exact arithmetic in this case you need to be able to because these numbers are floating point numbers that are in that sense they are exact reals you know certain reals and for these reals you have to make the right decision um, and I use actually a trick here um, to do this quickly is that I exploit the I triple E floating point representation of double precision numbers. If you um, map a double precision number to the interval one to two, 
then you have you know, a certain fixed exponent. In this case, the 53-bit mantissa is basically an, an, an integer, represents an integer mapping that is one-to-one -one of all possible integers, uh, or say all floating point numbers between one and two are mapped precisely on one of these integers in a linear way. And so I read out in this case the integer representation here and calculate the sign with exact integer ar arithmetic. That's pretty simple to do, and that way I achieve complete robustness also in degenerate cases. <coughs> so let me now as address another aspect that comes into play. You actually have substantial freedom in such a moving mesh code to move the mesh. And that raises the issue, uh, maybe you want to move it such that you get some sort of good meshes, whatever this means, according to some criterion. Here I show you a mesh that maybe is not so good. This here is a Voronoi mesh of 625 points randomly thrown into a square. You get this sort of Voronoi mesh from it. And what's not good about this mesh is that there are lots of cells that are of large aspect ratios, like these thin slivers here. There are cells that are small, others that are large. So if you want to represent a homogeneous density field with this thing, you're, um, you're basically wasting some resources, right, because <coughs> your time step will be determined by the smallest cells and you lose resolution in these big things, it would be much better for a homogeneous density field to have a, a mesh, for example, like this, right? This would be what I would call a regularized Voronoi mesh, where now the mesh cells are roughly of equal size everywhere. And now there are um, ways to generate or maintain regularized Voronoi meshes during a calc during a um, during a dynamical calculation. So here, the, the reason why you want to have this, optimal use of variable resolution, no small time steps due to accidentally more cells, and so on, high accuracy of spatial resolution. Um, so one approach is the Lloyd's algorithm. In this one, this is curious, very simple. So here, <coughs> you start from a random Voronoi mesh, and you then reposition at each step the mesh generating point to the center of mass of its associate cell. You reconstruct the tessellation and repeat with step one. So this thing converges very slowly to a so-called centroidal Voronoi tessellation. So I show you what this is. This is step zero of, say, a Poisson Voronoi mesh, as we've just seen. If I do one of these Lloyd steps, I get this. If I do another one, I get this. And then you, if you do a couple, or say 100, you get something like this. It's like a honey web. You do a 1,000, you get this. It gets very regular. But this is somehow, you know, the convergence of this is actually not mathematically understood at this point. There are only weak results for that. But so we, we want to use something more sophisticated maybe because we're also not interested just in homogeneous density fields. We have other requirements maybe in, in particular simulations. In particular, if we want to study isolated systems um, like say a, a, a rotating gaseous disk or so where lots of space is actually empty. So there we have another problem that if we let the mesh move and if there's a lot of empty space, then we can't uh, really move the mesh there with the fluid velocity. It doesn't really make much sense because there's no fluid there. And in particular, we don't want to have constant mass per cell because there are lots of um, cells that essentially contain no mass if there's empty space. So we have to think about this a bit harder. Here is what I came up with in this, in this context. So suppose, for example, we want to simulate a gaseous disk with an exponential surface profi profile. So if in SPH you would just throw out, say, with a rejection method or whatever, you, you initialize a random sample of this disk, and if you make a raw mesh for that point set, you would get something like this. And here I've added also a Cartesian background grid that gives you these cells over here. So that is needed to sample some, at some resolution the rest of the volume that's basically empty. If you then calculate the volume of the cells you have as a function of uh, distance from the center, you get this sort of scatter plot, right? So you see that in the inner parts of the disk, the volumes of the cells are small, the resolution is good, and then they grow out to the maximum, which is here in this empty region. The mass of the cells, on the other hand, is constant in the inner parts, where I had these points, the fixed mass points, and then it drops to the outer parts. And the, in, the surface mass density is the, the, the profile I put in, so each cell contains the right mass for its size. So this is exactly what I want to have. But I still have this large scatter here in the mass and the volume, which is completely undesired. So how, how do I get rid of this? So one, one way to do this is to uh, 
calculate a few auxiliary equations along the ride, basically, along um, the mesh motion, and you add some corrective velocity to the mesh motion that keeps your mesh nice and regular. So just very briefly, actually, to the lack of time, I'm, I don't want to go through the derivation. You can look this up in a PDF that I will, will post also. This yields uh, this desire, so you can put in um, constraints on how the mesh should be behaved and, and calculate a, uh, a Poisson-like equation that gives you a displacement vector that you, you add um, to the mesh motion such that the mesh fulfills certain desired um, uh, constraints. And some of the constraints that you might, for example, put, so here I've chosen that I want that the cells have a constant value A for some quantity AI, which is made up by the comparing the mass of the cell to some mean mass plus velocity of the cell to some mean velocity. And that should be constant. That's what I want. Why constant? Well, basically in the high density region, the volume of the cell will be small. So this second term is negligible. And then I have constant mass per cell. In the um, low density region, the mass in the cell is negligible. So, but I want then that the volume per cell is constant. So that you then can ach achieve a smooth transition from um, by solving this, this elliptics along with, say, the gravity solver, you can calculate sort of correction vectors that move the mesh in, in a desired fashion. And I show you an example here <coughs> how this works in practice. <coughs> so he, or I show you two examples. Here is, again, the Poisson mesh. What you don't see over, overlaid on this is that actually all this, the density is now not constant here, but I put in a constant density, uh, a certain density pattern, and I now request this algorithm to move the mesh such that the mass per cell is constant. Right? So that means if there's a high density region, then more cells should go into this high density region. Okay, let me see what happens here. Okay, and there we are, and then we go back. So these sort of games you can play. So you have pretty, pretty uh, large control over your mesh motion, but a more um, physical application is sort of, sort of this disk. So if you apply this uh, trick to this disk, you then can have such a situation where you have now a more regular or non mesh, but you get in the dense parts that the mass per cell is constant, and in the um, Low density parts eventually transition smoothly to a regime where this, the volume per cell is constant, while you still have the desired exponential mass profile. And um, it's maybe nicer to look at this in a again in an animation. So this is um, how this then works, and you know this is again at reasonably low resolution, but um, I, I would say, you know, works quite well. You can now follow individual cells, and I think there will be some markers on put on top of the cells in a, in a second. <coughs> Does that actually work? For another movie, then. Now, if you follow by eye, if you can manage an individual cell, you'll see how this um, mesh topology really changes smoothly, and why, and why is mesh twisting avoided? It's because cell faces continuously shrink to zero, and at that point, you can change the neighborhood relationships. The topology changes at that point, and then a new face between two previously disjoint uh, cells opens up and allows you then to exchange fluxes. Now, uh, <coughs> another fun thing you can do with this is it allows you to treat uh, certain boundary conditions and also moving boundaries and curved boundaries in some, some fashion. So here I play a game that I say, okay, I'll put in on an cart initially Cartesian grid of mesh generating points, I put in two, uh, spe string, two sets of special points, the red ones here and the blue ones, and arrange them as a string of points. And I then tell the code that the phase between the red and the blue points should be a reflecting solid wall. So it's treated with that boundary condition. And the fluid then only lives in this white region. Then I can move this object. If I treat these red and blue points as a solid body, I can s specify some arbitrary motion for that and then let things, let things move. And uh, let's see, this will 
take a second to load, um, how this here is working, this sort of spoon uh, that's moving in a sort of two-dimensional cup of coffee um, with some cream. And then you can start you know, mixing the fluid by this motion of, of, of the solid object. And um, you, know, you get lots of uh, eddies, obviously. So that was um, 768 on 768. Great. So there's essentially one cell per pixel, basically. But I think this sort of boundary condition, putting this in, is, is not trivial in a Cartesian code. And um, also, you see how the um, you know, turbulent structure is uh, developing and how uh, little mixing in these complicated shear layer, uh, you know, layers, fo foliated contact discontinuous happens, actually. So this is, um, of course, after a while, you will eventually will all get gray and all, all get mixed. But um, so in, any, you know, in each time step here, you actually calculate a new Voronoi mesh. So you can do this rather rapidly. <laughs> well, in, if it's in pure hydro, like this, probably 80% of the time. But if I run it with self-gravity, because my self-gravity is so slow, then it drops to 40%, something like this. So it's not dominating completely. So that means an, uh, this code is <coughs> not very much slower. I mean, it is slower a bit than an equivalent SPH code, but not uh, prohibitively slower, I would say. Yeah, I've shown you already some results for collapse calculations, right? When, like the, uh, the um, Everard collapse, right? So you just, nothing special. I mean, the cells just get denser, and you get, of course, depending on what the dynamics then dictates, you know, get bounce back structure, you get realization shocks. But this, the, the thing is that the method is adaptive, and um, here's another calculation now in 3D that shows you that you can actually, it's a little, startup error here in the initial conditions in the outer parts of this disk, but um, you, you can do full 3D calculations of, for example, colliding disk galaxies. So this is the problem I'm interested in, and Lars Hermquist, who I work with, that we would like to see what are the differences now with such a moving mesh calculation compared to, say, SPH. But you can follow large gravitational collapse and um, three-dimensional shocks and also, you know, regions where this is where large parts of the volume is, is essentially empty. This is here is non rotative So this is now realizing to a gaseous atmosphere around an elliptic galaxy. And um, yeah, I think I wanna wanna stop here. <coughs> ah, he caught it. <laughs> no, I mean I um, Actually, this is confusing, so I think I'm still not at the bottom of this. <coughs> Obviously, one of the most interesting questions is, can this scheme help to settle the question, which mesh, what's the right answer for the Santa Barbara cluster or not? And um, so basically here, the, the answer is this. If I run this moving mesh code with the total energy equation in the hydrosolver, I get a core like the mesh codes. This is this result. If, however, I think, due to various tests that I haven't, don't have time to go into detail, I'm by now convinced that um, in this coupled collisional dark matter hydro calculations, I actually see in this run and also other calculations where it's even clearer, I see heating of the gas from noise in the potential of the dark matter. And this is actually non-negligible and I think that it might be, or I, you know, I've done some tests that suggest that some of this entropy could be a relic of that, so I'm not sure about it. I've done tests where I've invented a scheme where in addition to the uh, total energy equation, I also solved the entropy equation, and I if I suppress dissipation in, in very, very weak shocks, then I get very low entropy there. Right? So it's basically coming from very weak shocks, this excess entropy, and it might be turbulence, but some of it might also be very weak shocks 
just because the gas is shaken around by noise in the gravitation potential of dark matter. And that's an, a thing that I investigate at the moment. So I described to you here uh, uh, this novel quasi Lagrangian hydrometric code, a rapport. And this is sort of a in between, well, it is a mesh code really, but it's using this very complicated mesh. Um, and it has interesting properties, right? Because it, its truncation error is in principle uh, not sensitive to Galilean boost. The artificial viscosity is also low, like so it, it keeps lots of the good things in your layering codes, but it also keeps good things from SPH, namely the automatic Lagrangian adaptivity of the mesh, the continuous change in resolution in collapse calculations. You don't have to discontinuously change resolution and make a decision when you do this. This happens sort of automatically, so as long as quasi-Lagrangian refinement is the right thing to do. You, this is a very nice approach. The mesh geometry is very flexible. No preferred directions along coordinate axis. And I've, I've, in this code, this is actually fully working in 2D and 3D, and it's, it's parallel. And I've managed to do this uh, reasonably well because I basically just shoplifted in my own code Gadget 3 from some of the gravity routines, for example. And, uh, you can also, and that's the nice thing also in this approach, you can also <coughs> make Cartesian meshes with it. It's not the most efficient way to do this, obviously, but for test purposes, very nice that you can do that. You can also use other unstructured types of meshes, right? So you can not only do Cartesian meshes, but you can arrange your mesh generating points in a fixed way, somewhere that you have more resolution somewhere, or that you can even uh, use sort of pseudo-polar grids that avoid, for example, uh, poles, uh, at, uh, at the north and the south pole and so on, so you can do sort of a, a, a heel peaks like mesh, for example, that covers all solid angles equally. This is all interesting, interesting properties. But the price you pay, obviously, is, a, uh, is, is algorithmic complexity. The bookkeeping of this mesh is, is, uh, is, is, is uh, not easy, but it's, it's doable. But um, yeah, I just, you know, I invite you to try this out, but it, it, it can be costly in terms of time. It cost me a couple of months to, to get this done. Thanks a lot. Thank you.